Okay, it's now 4 p.m., so I can begin, but just to give the preamble to this Word of the Buddha class, uh, Sutta class, uh, you may know that over a hundred years ago, uh, Venerable uh, Jnana Tiloka, a German monk, translated some passages from the suttas. Uh, those were important passages based upon the theme of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And as such, it created like a, a summary of the essential Buddhist teachings, and in particular, it was uh, based upon core teachings repeated many times uh, within the suttas. And it became a classic, but some of the translations and some of the explanations were very repetitive and also have been surpassed. Over a hundred years of translating, we come across much better translations for some of the key terms. And so, uh, because of that, uh, having to do sutta classes, uh, especially to teach every young uh, Anagarika or novice who is going to be ordained to make sure they have a core basis in the Buddha's teachings. I decided to use that, but with like amendments. In other words, taking out much of the repetition, changing the, uh, some of the similes, but with still keeping the meaning. Uh, an example of that will come across later is the simile of a person who is a non-returner, hasn't reached the path, the fruit of being an arahat yet, fully enlightened. And what is the difference there? And the simile which you may have come across before is that someone doing washing washes a cloth with cow dung and lye and then uh, hangs it up to dry, and it still has a smell on it. And for many people, including myself, even though I've read that so many times, you started to wonder, what is a person washing a cloth in cow poo? But that was what was done in those days. But what it does, that cultural anachronistic anomaly, means that one doesn't actually focus on the core meaning of that simile. So later on you'll see me, an obvious change. Suppose you do your washing in the washing machine and you put in soap powder, which is, we don't put in cow dung or kangaroo dung, you put in soap powder and after you've washed it, rinsed it, tumbled, dried it, you hang it on the line and it still has the scent of the, uh, the, the washing powder. In the same way that even though an anagami has basically washed out all the defilements, it still has this, the scent, the last lingering aroma of a self. And that means that the simile has much more power, so people can understand it. And also that those of you who have tried to uh, read the suttas, they have so much repetition, where in English we'd say it very quickly, and in uh, Partly we say it so many times, uh, which doesn't add anything to the meaning, but actually detracts from the understanding, and actually it turns a lot of people off. And so the reason why I started retranslating this was based on advice, which when I first saw this in A.K. Waters, Professor A.K. Waters' introduction to the Pali language, uh, he mentioned that when you translate you should never translate word for word, but phrase for phrase. In other words, a unit of ideas is the sentence, or the sub-sentence, which is the phrase. And the symbol I always use is many people, when you first learned English, came across the phrase, it was raining cats and dogs. And that causes much amusement in English classes, 
And that is actually what it says, but what it means was it was raining heavily. And so we just do not translate word for word. We translate phrase for phrase, which makes the meaning sort of emerge and it comes very powerful. So that's the, the uh, prologue for this translation. Uh, I know many people have asked me, when it's finished, can I have a copy? But you know me, I get so busy, I never have much time to actually to add this and add that. So it is still work in progress. So here we go. Now before we actually start uh, teaching suttas, we usually do a Namo Tassa first of all, out of reverence for the word of the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sambuddhasa The Four Noble Truths then the Buddha addressed the community thus. First change in translation, the original said the monks thus, which straight away turns off the nuns, the lay men, the lay women, what about us? So saying community there again makes it more applicable, which it's supposed to be for everybody. It is through not fully understanding and penetrating the Four Noble Truths that I, as well as you, have experienced the cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. Because of not fully understanding the noble truth of suffering, we have experienced the cycle of rebirth and death. By not fully understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and the noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, that we have, for a long time, experienced the cycle of rebirth and death. Now, of course, I won't say this more often because I'm saying it's, it's misleading and just takes you away to start uh, talking about uh, 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 repetition. But in the original, it would, through not understanding penetrating the for, for because of not fully understanding the noble truth of suffering, we've experienced the cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time and then repeat the whole phrase, not fully understanding the noble truth of the origin of suffering. We have experienced the cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. For not understanding, fully understanding the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, we have uh, experienced the cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. And by not experiencing, fully experiencing the noble truth of the past leading to the cessation of suffering, that we have uh, experience a cycle of rebirth and death for a very long time. Now, that's always repeated when you read the suttas. So you see, by taking some of those repetitions out, it's not altering the meaning, but it's actually making it clearer. And I will not repeat that again. <laughs> so, oh, whoops, you're a bit too high. So long as my penetration and insight into these Four Noble Truths as they really are was not thoroughly complete, and you come across this, so we put it in here, in their three phases and twelve aspects. I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed, unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. So in other words, you can't get more than that. And it's often said because still some people say, and it goes against what the Buddha clearly said, that once you become enlightened, fully enlightened in our heart, then you can go to the highest stage and become a bodhisattva. It never says that. In fact, it says the opposite. The unsurpassed uh, perfect enlightenment in this world. But when my penetration and insight into these Four Noble Truths, as they really are, was thoroughly complete in their three phases and twelve aspects, then did I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world. You see the word awakened. It's as if that one's mindfulness, one's penetrating insight is never strong enough. But when you really get into it, you, it's like, wow, you wake up. 
So, and again, this is how we become enlightened. I understand the Four Noble Truths. Do you understand the Four Noble Truths? What's the first Noble Truth? Second Noble Truth? Yeah. Third Noble Truth? Yeah. And the Fourth Noble Truth? So you understand it. So you're all enlightened. <laughs> so what's the problem there? Because it says thoroughly. Thoroughly. That's the problem. There's some part of it we just don't get. So, uh, so the Four Noble Truths in their three phases and twelve aspects. So we have the first Noble Truth here, the Noble Truth of Suffering. Suffering is to be fully understood. Suffering has been fully understood. Okay, that's, there's three there. The Noble Truth of Suffering. Suffering is to be fully understood. What are you supposed to do with it? and the completion of that purpose. Suffering has been fully understood. So, you understand the noble truth of suffering, fully understand it. No, it's not to just to be known so you can um, debate it with others or write a book about it. It's to be fully understood. Not, and now it has been fully understood. What it is, its purpose, and the completion of that purpose. Those are the three, uh, the three phases. Noble truth of the origin of suffering. The truth of suffering is to be understood. The origin of suffering, what it is, wanting that causes rebirth. And wanting the origin of suffering, the purpose of that uh, second noble truth, is to be abandoned. Letting go, giving up, renouncing it. And wanting the origin of suffering has been abandoned. So suffering has been fully understood. Its origin has been abandoned. The third noble truth, what it is, the noble truth of cessation of suffering, what its purpose is, is to, the third noble truth to extinguish that wanting and the uh, completion of that purpose, the end of wanting, the cessation of suffering, sorry, the cessation of suffering is to be realized, that's its purpose, and the end of wanting has been realized. And the fourth noble truth, what it actually is, this is a noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. Understand what that truth is, now what are we supposed to do with it? First of all, we're supposed to scroll up. The Noble True Eightfold Path is to be developed. That's what you're supposed to do with it. And the Noble Eightfold Path has been developed. So each of those four noble truths, to understand what it is, what you're supposed to do with it, and then understanding what has to be done is complete. Thus, in regard to things unheard before in this generation, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. Unheard in this generation. Do you think it was never heard before at all? There were previous Buddhas. Exactly, this generation. So, it means fall apart, disappeared, and then the Buddha simile later on you'll see the lost city in the, in the forest and find that path, get to that lost city. So this generation was forgotten, but not, uh, not original. There arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. I consider this Dharma that has been awakened to is profound. Hard to see and hard to understand. So it's not simple stuff, but it's peaceful and sublime. You'll stop at that word peaceful, because if it is a wisdom which doesn't lead to peace, but leads to war and convincing other people and having to go knocking on doors to tell people what the truth really is, if it's not peaceful, it's not the Dhamma and unattainable by mere reasoning. Reasoning, logic, uh, allows you to uh, put aside, put away some of the, the dead end, the cul-de-sacs of thought, which don't need anywhere, but you have to be more than just reason. Subtle to be experienced by the wise, 
not to be believed in by the wise, to be experienced by the wise. And it doesn't mention which people. It doesn't say just wise guys. Wise women, wise any race, gender, sexual orientation, old, young, by the wise. So you know that wisdom uh, is uh, something any person can develop. It is not just specific, just to one gender, one race, one sexuality. But this generation delights in attachment to a self. When we talk about attachment, often we start to think of what we are attached to. But to have attachment is like a rope tying two things together, like a chain which links two things. And we often think of that end of the chain. But, it's what about this end of the chain? Just like I said last night or this morning, it's not you take the dog for a walk, the dog takes you for a walk. It's not that you own your house, your house owns you. <laughs> it's not that you make use of your mobile phone, <laughs> your iPad, or whatever it is, that owns you and uses you. So, yes, our delights in the attachment to a self takes delight in attachment to a self, and rejoices in attachment to a self. So we're not looking at what you're so much atta attached to, but, you know, those things are attached to you. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely, the empty process of cause and effect, dependent cessation and origination. So, this, those of you who have been brainwashing me over the last Rains retreat, you know, always talking about processes, processes, processes. It's always no God, no Brahma. This is from the Patisim Bida Magga. Can be seen as a, a, a creating this world. Empty processes roll on, dependent on causes. All that's the very famous phrase, which is also repeated in the Sudhi Magga, but has its origin in the Patisim Bida Magga. So, the empty process of cause and effect. A cause creating effect, effect creating the next effect, and that creates the next effect. But there's empty, there's nothing substantial in it. Otherwise called dependent cessation and origination. And you see there, they always have dependent origination. Just like many of the suttas always talk about monks and never say about nuns. So, but the truth of the matter is it's not just origination and cessation. Those are the two parts of paticca, samupada, even that samupada is just called just the origination, but it also includes when those causes end, so does the effect. Dependent cessation and origination, rise and fall. Furthermore, it is hard to embrace this truth. In fact, it's scary. Namely, the stilling and disappearance of the will. And this is where, you know, I start to translate uh, Sabha-sankara Samatha. Samatha, you all know, is a stilling of something. And the Sankara, Sankara is used for many, 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 many um, uh, phenomena. But in particular, it is referred to the core sankara, the thing which really makes it up, is the will. And as many uh, people say, the sankara has, you know, the, the fact that what causes something and the effect, what it caused, it's been created, it's been made, it's been willed. But the Buddha made it very clear that the main part of that sankara you know, the causal part of the Sankara is this thing called the will. And that is really challenging. That's why it's hard to embrace. The stilling and disappearance of your will, your intention. People think, that's scary. The relinquishing of everything that has been acquired. And that is also a bit scary. 
you've acquired so much. You are a MA, a PhD. And what does PhD mean? Permanent head damage. <laughs> Your reputation, whatever it is. But everything you've acquired, you've willed and got by hard effort. Yeah, everything is relinquished. Stream winning, once winning, what are you? Are you a non-returner? You've acquired that, now you've got to relinquish it. Uh, we do the questions at the, the end of the little, phase, uh, little, page, little stages. But, uh, what else have we got? Relinquishing of everything that's been acquired, the destruction of wanting, everything fading away, cessation, nibbana. And for the fading away, use wiraga. That's the word wiraga. Sometimes it's called dispassion, but it really doesn't mean that. It means things disappearing, fading away. Cessation, nibbana. But there are beings with little dust in their eyes. That's a nice little simile which you can't really improve upon. That are wasting through not hearing this dhamma. There will be those who will understand this dhamma. Emptiness. Okay. There were those who will understand this dhamma. So, uh, please, if everybody asks a question, we will never get any much further for this whole Sutta class. So I'll take just three questions. Any questions here? Yeah? Penetrating an insight is not a specific meaning, as it says in the, uh, uh, just in English, penetrating means seeing deeply into something. And in other words, deep insight, deep seeing. So sometimes that people have insight, but it's quite superficial. So I remember in my book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, uh, I think you called it Happiness Through Meditation in the uh, Singapore edition, I gave a simile between deep insight and insight. And I was making a little bit of fun out of an old story, a Zen story, where um, two monks were arguing. And those two monks, one saw a flag fluttering, one said the flag is moving, and the other one says the wind is moving. So then they went to the Zen master who said, you're both wrong, the mind is moving. And they weren't satisfied that. So then they went to the uh, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Monastery, and they asked the head nun and said, you're all wrong. The mind, w the, the mouth was moving. <laughs> Now, the first one, your mind is moving. I call that insight. When you say the, mi the mouth was moving, that's deep insight. <laughs> Seeing it in a different way. So that's really penetrating. Going further, not just repeating what other people have told you. That's how you've got to penetrate. Okay, let's go for what these things actually are. The noble truth of suffering. Ah, of the process, yes, ending, ceasing, stopping, disappearing. Not just stopping the wanting, the... No, the whole the process is actually ceasing. We have everything, everything fading away. It's all called sabha. Sabha is the part away from more. The destruction of thing. Uh, everything fading away, everything ceasing, stopping. Now, okay, you ask that question, and people sometimes ask, well, if it is even a process, a process carries information, it's energy, and there's a basic law of science which applies, you know, not just in the physical world, in every other world, is energy, information, can't be created or destroyed. It can be transformed. So how, how can you have things actually ceasing without remainder? And the answer is a simile 
of this, this great cosmos in which we live. In this cosmos, there's stuff like what you're sitting on and who's sitting on top of it. There's mass, there's energy. And as Kim Jong-un knows, you can transform mass into energy. It's called a hydrogen bomb. And what that, or an atom bomb, whichever one you do, and what that actually means, but you can't create and destroy things, you just transform them. So, how can this universe come from nothing? And the answer is quite clear. There is, in science, what we know as negative energy. And I don't mean like being fed up. <laughs> I mean physical negative energy. And the one uh, example of that which you can know is like what you learnt at school, potential energy. So take Ajahn Brahm and lift him out of space. You have to take away a lot of energy. There's a negative energy component in me. So actually to take this massive body and just to get it into orbit, that takes a lot of energy. So what would it be like if to actually to take me out of the gravitational field of, of the Earth, all the mass in my body had to be used. So when I get to outer space, there's nothing left. What, that's just a little example. I think there will be something left. But what we're saying is there is a negative energy component in the universe. And I still recall the time when I just made that proposal to Professor David Blair, who's our local professor of physics over here in Perth. And he turned around and gave me a nice bit of praise. He said, wow, well, you're so up to date. Omega equals one. I don't know what omega actually means, but I know it equals one. It's something to do with the, the balance of, of um, uh, negative and positive mass energy in the universe. So if all the energy, if all the stars, the galaxies, the dark matter, everything, if it could all come together, what would it, would it be like a big black hole? It would actually just vanish, poof, gone, disappear. No energy remaining. That's a nice simile for cessation. A process which when it stops, has got no energy left to carry on. Da, da, da. Anyway, unfortunately this class makes you think too much and so your meditation will be stuffed this afternoon. <laughs> after this class. <laughs> the noble truth of suffering. And what is the noble truth of suffering. Rebirth is suffering, isn't it? What's wrong with rebirth? Why is that suffering? Why is it when you have a grandchild? It's a celebration. Woohoo! Another birth. What does a kid think? <laughs> when a baby is born, the parents and grandparents smile and laugh, and the baby cries. When the kid eventually becomes an old person and dies, you go to a funeral, and the person in the box is always smiling, and everyone else is crying. We've got it the wrong way around. <laughs> so, when somebody is born, we should all wear black. Morning clothes. And when somebody dies, we should have a big party. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to get much further in that one. So aging is suffering, yeah we know that. Death is suffering, sorrow, love, actually dying is suffering, the death is not really suffering. Aging could change that to dying, much, much better. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, negativity and distress are suffering. Now, what was it? Uh, pain, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. That's what they usually have. And you look at that, and it's grief and despair. It doesn't really sort of cut the uh, cut the uh, the mustard. And so it, try and make some better words to actually make it more sort of uh, meaningful for people. And it's not just despair; it's like distress. So anyway, that's uh, new little um, uh, translations. And again, that's why it's work in progress. I'm sure somebody will come up with something a little bit better than that, but at least I'm moving away from something which is stuck in decades of uh, not moving any further.
distress or suffering. Experiencing what is unpleasant is suffering. Yeah, that's obviously. Missing what is pleasing is suffering. Yeah. Not getting what one wants is suffering. In short, the five components of existence, the five candles that fully describe your body and mind are suffering. And these are now explained. So, not getting what you want is suffering. For example, every time you want something, you're separated from where you want to be. You are suffering. So I said, remember yesterday, the, the hands, here's where I want to be, here is where I am, and I want to sort of uh, unite the two. And I said, well, just trying to get to where you want to be makes a lot of stress. Why not uh, where you want to be is where you are? End of problem. Have we still got that little cartoon up in the, uh, the dining area that this person goes to a monk? I want happiness. Is that still there? Oh, okay. I wonder what happened to it. Somebody probably took it away. Probably Mara. <laughs> <laughs> so this man, really upset, goes to the, no, let's change it, to the nun. And he's got this big, I want happiness. And the monk looks at him and takes the sign. Straight away, he deletes, rubs out, brings to cessation the I. So that's ego. That's the first problem. So you've got want happiness. Then he takes the, the eraser and rubs out want. And what does that leave? Happiness. And everyone's smiling. <laughs> so simple. I want happiness. And you just get suffering. So take away the I, take away the want, and what's left? Happiness. Simple. You can all go home now. <laughs> Me too. So, now we, that's um, some of the explanation, but now the Buddha's explanation. What is rebirth? In whatever type of beings, of whatever species of beings, there is rebirth, coming to be, coming forth, the appearance of the candors, these are components of existence, the acquisition of the senses, that is called rebirth. Now, this is important because some people so, well, what rebirth is, is just rebirth in the moment. You can interpret it like that if you wish. We're not going to burn you at the stake, imprison you, call you a heretic, and throw you out of Jhana Grove with a black mark on your name so that when you try and apply to come in again, you can't. You can understand uh, rebirth that way, but that's not what the Buddha meant. That's really important. What the Buddha was pointing to here, his meaning is the rebirth in the sense of uh, people being born. Joey's coming out of the pouch. Bugs appearing from the, from the lava. Butterflies coming out from the lava. There's the birth. What is aging? In whatever type of beings or whatever species of beings, there is aging, decrepitude, broken teeth. Unfortunately, we have dentists these days. Grey hair. Unfortunately, we have hair dye. Wrinkled skin. We have Botox. Shrinking with age. Oh, we have all sorts of dis decay of the senses. You can have glasses, uh, uh, implants in your ears, cochlear implants. This is called aging. It's much easier to see in the old days, but you know what we mean. We try and hide aging, but you all know <laughs> it's there. Uh, uh, what is death? In whatever type of beings or whatever species of beings, there is a passing away, a demise, a disappearance, a death, a dying disease, a destruction of the candors, a discarding of the body, that is called death. Now, again, the reason why I do not try and uh, condense what looks like a dictionary, is because in this particular case the Buddha wanted to make everyone quite clear what he means by these. Death in its normal sense, aging in its normal sense, and birth in its normal sense. What is so, whenever by any kind of misfortune anyone is affected by something of a painful nature, sorrow, mourning, anguish, grief, unhappiness, that is called sorrow, 
What is lamentation? We're never paying a misfortune. <laughs> Anyone is affected by something of a painful nature and is a crying out, a weeping, making much noise for grief, wailing. That is called lamentation. <laughs> and what is pain? Ow! Whatever painful feeling results from bodily contact, that is called pain. What is unhappiness? Whatever mental painful feeling arises from the mind, that is called unhappiness. What is distress? Whenever by any kind of misfortune, anguish arises from something of a painful or unpleasant nature, that is called distress. And what is experiencing what is unpleasant? Whoever has unwanted, dislike, unpleasant sight, sound, smells, taste, touch or mind objects. Whoever meets those who wish you harm, cause you discomfort or insecurity, that is called experiencing what is unpleasant. And what is missing, what is pleasing? Whoever has pleasant sights, sounds, smells, taste, or tangibles of mind objects. And whoever encounters well wishes, those who provide you with comfort or security, such as family or friends or nice monks and nuns. And then you're deprived of such interaction or connection. That is called missing what is pleasing. And what is not getting what one wants in beings subject to, I think this, this might be an older version, but it doesn't matter. Subject to birth, this desire arises, oh that we are not subject to birth, that we might never be reborn. But this cannot be gained by desire, that is not getting what one wants. That's an example. So it's not a definition, but that's the only thing which the Buddha means, that's an example. But I think he puts it in there because I don't know how many times people have come up and said, oh, I don't want to get reborn again. They told me that. So, oh, that we're not subject to birth, we might never be reborn, but this cannot be gained by desire. You'll find out how to get there in a moment. That is not getting what one wants. In being subject to ageing, to disease, to death, to sorrow, lamentation, pain, negativity, distress, they might want, oh, that we were not subject to aging. So maybe, maybe we can actually find out why the mitochondria fray at the edges, and why we may live longer. Maybe, maybe if I eat more carrots and less condensed milk, then I will not be subject to aging, disease, to death. But that cannot be gained by eating carrots. Oh, so by wanting. <laughs> I do eat carrots. That is not getting what one wants. And you always add a few little bit of extras here. The, uh, yeah, it was Oscar Wilde. Was it George Bernard Shaw? <laughs> also Oscar Wilde. Who stated there are only two tragedies in life? The first tragedy is not getting what you want. And the second tragedy in life is getting what you want. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why Mara came to the Buddha and said, what do you want? I'll give it for you. That's just more suffering. If you get what you want, it doesn't stop the one thing, it just actually encourages it. That's why people who win these big lotteries, they win lotteries, they've got millions and millions and millions of pounds and they go and buy a lottery ticket next time. You are you satisfied? So five components of existence. Now, this is usually called the five aggregates. But for a monk who's uh, uh, mixed many, many cubic meters of concrete, aggregate is a blue metal, the stones which you put with the cement and the sand and the water. We call that aggregate in the building industry. So, aggregates never really sort of made much sense. But it's best better, I've called the five components of existence. What makes up this thing we call existence? And how in particular are the five components of existence suffering? They are as follows. The body, now here is another little um, new translation, experience instead of Vedana. Because many times we call that just feeling, and feeling can be emotional, it's, you know, it's not just concerned with the, the body sensations. 
And this is basic experience over all the six senses. And it's sometimes we call it the three types of experience, you know, the pleasure, pain, or in between. But that is just like human beings. Human beings, males, females, in-betweens. It might be like the races, you know, dark skin, light skin, gray skin, whatever skinned. So, but what we're talking about here, what this is pointing to is this experience part of the, uh, the uh, uh, thing we call a human being and other beings as well. Perception, sanya, and this is, later on we'll uh, see what perception means. This is just how we get to know something by giving it labels. When you see something, there's no way that you can actually encompass every aspect of, you know, even like a, a teddy bear over there. You know, there's only some aspects you pick out and leave others aside. You know, call it cuddly. But some other people might be allergic to it. Flower, beautiful. For others, sneezy. <laughs> Hay fever sufferers. So this is perception. At Missing a comma, it must be one of the old ones, but anyway, we'll fix it up later on. Will and other mental formations, that's the Sankaras. And it is, will is the main one, but there's a plus, uh, other mental formations. And the fifth of the components of existence is consciousnesses. That is not a typo. Consciousness is. There's six types of consciousness, different types of consciousness. They're not the same. So it's wonderful just putting consciousness is, the plural, instead of the singular, changes the whole ball game, as they say. What it means is it's not consciousness which people will, will uh, tie the idea of a soul, uh, a continuous essence, a ground of all being too, but it's six consciousnesses. These are the five components of existence that are suffering. And that is called the noble truth of suffering. And this is from the Chudwantala Sutta. Lady, this is, is that fuel? Upadana. Because sometimes you call the Upadana Kandas. And Upadana is sometimes translated as attachment, that doesn't get to the real root meaning of the word. You all know the word adin ardana, where am I? Adina means not given, ardana means taking up or taking. So ardana there means taking and up, the upward, is pretty similar to the English word up. It means taking up, drawing into. And upadana is like the fuel, very much like the gas which the engine takes up. The engine draws into itself, you know, with the oxygen and other stuff, which actually drives this thing we call the, the uh, body and mind, the components of existence. And that idea of fuel is far more uh, accurate and meaningful they just attachment. So is this fuel which drives this process the same as these five com components of existence, or is the fuel something apart from the five components of existence? Friend Wisaka, that fuel is neither the same as the five components of existence, nor is the fuel separate from the five components of existence. It is a desire and wanting, that's the fuel, that is part of these existence. Of this part of these five components of existence. That is a fuel that sustains them. So in this five components of existence, the five candors, that contains the fuel, which creates the next five components of existence, which also creates the fuel. So the fuel which keeps it going is within the process, not outside of the process. Now, any kind of body, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, fat or thin, no, no, far, far, so far. <laughs> <laughs> far or near, any type of body, 
This is the body component of his existence. All bodies should be seen as they really are with correct wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not my permanent essence. Instead of saying soul or self, you know, what that means, the atta, you know, it, it means like the essence of something. It's, if you want to um, have an English translation of that, we have like the adjective, you're happy, and happiness, the essence of being happy. You're tired, and tiredness is like the essence of being tired. Really. It makes an abstract noun out of uh, an adjective. So, it's, that's atta. It is, you can see that in, in other words now. I've got a... Um, oh, I can't think of anything about in Pali. But you add atta to the end of it, and it becomes like the same as putting any double S at the end of an English weir, word. Kind and kindness. Uh, anyway. Any kind of experience, whatever. Vedana, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, one's own or others, even like heavenly beings, even people in hell realms, far or near. This is the experience component of existence, and all experience should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not your permanent essence. Sometimes you think, now I'm happy. This is the real me. No way. Any kind of will, another mental formation, whatever, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the will of mental formations component of existence. All will should be seen as they really are, with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. That's great when you, know, you, you actually put that word will in there and you say, this is not mine. You're out of control. You don't own the will. It is not your essence. So who the heck is it? That will be answered later on. When you read a novel, you don't go to the last page to find out who did it, otherwise be no reason to read the whole novel. So, who is the will? What is the will? Who controls all of this? That will be found pretty soon. Anyway, so your will. It's not mine, it's not you, it's not your permanent essence. Any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future or present. I've already mentioned the six different types of consciousness is any kind of that. Past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, cosmic, godly, uh, whatever you want to call it, all types of consciousnesses should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine. You don't own your consciousness. This is not who you are. This is not your permanent essence. Doesn't leave much else, does it? Precisely. So, the form, body, component of existence. What is a form, component of existence? It is the four great elements and the physical qualities derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements? Earth, water, fire and the air element. I don't really go too much into that because I usually look at forms like quarks and, and hadrons and leptons and stuff. That's just different ways of describing this thing we call stuff. And I was saying to someone recently, you know that simile which is coming down soon, I'm really flying ahead of myself. Oh, sorry, I'm flying ahead of my no-self. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, the Buddha compares it to a lump of foam on the Ganges. And when you go to quantum physics, to the, oh, what's it called, the Planck level, 10 to the minus 36 meters, that's pretty small. At that time, stuff has no meaning and they describe it as foam. Stuff actually is, in theoretical physics, foam. Anyway, uh, experience, component of existence. There are these three types of experience. So just the three types is not what we're looking at, it's actually what those types are pointing to. 
What three? Pleasant experience to any of the six senses, unpleasant experience to any of the six senses, neither unpleasant nor pleasant experience through any of the six senses. These are the three types of experience. And if you look through the text, it says pleasant experience through the uh, sense of sight, and they repeat everything without actually just putting it all together, which makes it much easier to understand. Perception component of existence. What is perception? Are these six kinds of perceptions, perceptions of sight, sounds, odors, taste, touches, and perceptions of mental objects. The will and other formations component of existence. What are volitions? There are the six kinds of volitions. The will regarding sight, sounds, odors, tastes, touches, and mental objects. And the consciousnesses component of existence. What are consciousnesses? There are these six kinds of consciousness. Sight consciousness, hearing consciousness, smell consciousness, taste consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. Most people look at mind consciousness and that's what they think consciousness is, but the other five are sometimes just the lesser beings discriminated against, not giving equality to mind consciousness, but the Buddha never did that, so all consciousnesses are equal. Some are more equal than others, but <laughs> no, I'm only joking there. So, dependent origination of consciousnesses. In the sense of, if the sense of knowing, now they have this with all of these, but I just put down dependent origination of consciousnesses as an example, but also because this is where a lot of people miss the point. If the sense of knowing is intact, mind, but no mind objects come into its range, then there's no manifestation of mind consciousness. If the sense of knowing is intact, mind objects come into its range, but there's no conscious engagement, then there's no manifestation of mind consciousness. But when the sense of knowing is intact, mind objects come into its range, and there's conscious engagement, then the mind consciousness manifests. An example of that, you're having an operation under anaesthesia, and you haven't sort of got an out-of-the-body experience, you're just down there, on the table, and they're cutting you up, doing all sorts of stuff. You know your mind is intact, because when you come out of anaesthesia, you, you still are there. But no mind objects come into its range, there's no manifestation of mind consciousness. But when all these things are intact, and things come into its range, conscious engagement, then the mind of consciousness manifests. So what else we've got here? And so with the other five sense consciousnesses. So what we're saying here is this is dependent. When to have a conscious manifestation of mind consciousness or any other sense consciousness, you need all the causes in place. And when those causes aren't there, then there is no effect. It's dependent, orig or dependent origination. Everything which has a cause you understand that cause. And when those causes disappear, so does the effect. Mind, consciousness, all the other candors can disappear. That, by the way, was the, usually the standard definition of the attainment of Sotapanna. So consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. Now, I did keep the repetition here just because it is pushing a point. You know what, uh, sometimes when I went to school, sometimes that, you know, you had to do lines with the teacher. And I mustn't talk while the teacher's talking. I mustn't talk while the teacher's talking. I mustn't talk while the teacher's talking. <laughs> <laughs> and there wasn't so much a punishment, but a learning experience that, you know, it just got it into your brain. Consciousness is, reckoned, yeah, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent upon sight and visual object, it is reckoned as sight consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon hearing and sounds, it is reckoned as hearing consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon smell and odours, it is reckoned as smell consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon tastes and flavours, it is reckoned as taste consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent upon touch and tangibles, it is reckoned as touch consciousness. 
When consciousness arises dependent upon the mind and mind object, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. So whatever there is of form, that belongs to the form component of existence. Whatever there is of experience, that belongs to the experience component of existence. Whatsoever there is of perception, that belongs to the perception component of existence. Whatsoever there are of will and other mental formations, this belongs to the will component of existence. Whatever there is of consciousnesses, this belongs to the consciousnesses component of existence. So what we're doing here is just really putting, uh, making sure that there's no loopholes, there's no, nothing which uh, a smart um, lawyer could actually exploit as maybe there's something outside of these five candors. If there was something outside of the five candors, it can't be experience, because all experience is say whatever there is of experience belongs to that second of the Vedana Kanda. So, if there is some place outside of the five candors, we can live happily ever after. You can't experience it. You can't perceive it. You can't know it. Because any knowing, any type of consciousness, belongs to the con consciousness's component of existence. So, when you put it like that, you know, people think, oh, well, how can we sort of get around that? And basically, you can't which is great. Sankara. Now this is, uh, Ajahn Bhamadi asked me to put this one in, and brilliant. What is the Sankara component of existence? The definition of Sankara is the six types of will. The Chaitanakaya. Will involved with the objects of the six senses. That's in Samyutta 22, 56 and 57. Now, uh, you can find that online. Six types of will. Chaitana Kaya, and it is will, Chaitana. And you can also see here, that I just pointed out, because this comes up later, Chaitana Kaya. What's will supposed to do with a body, a Kaya? Because the word Kaya does not just mean this physical body, the Rupa Kanda. Kaya is a word much the same way as it's used in English, a body of evidence, a body of nuns. A body of meditators, a body of <coughs> will. It's used as any group of stuff coming together, a uh, uh, um, conglomerate, a body corporate you have, like in, uh, in business. So it's not just a physical body, and we come across that so often when people think, Kaya, for example, in the Anapana Sati, you're aware of the whole uh, body of breath, or the whole body, Sabakaya uh, Pati Sangwedi. And people still think Sabakaya Pati, or the, you watch the whole body. It doesn't mean the physical body, it means this conglomeration of experiences called one breath. And actually, the Buddha says that, and you come across that at the end of this. Word of the Buddha. So it's will involved with the objects of the six consciousnesses. And dependence, dependency of consciousnesses. Those, someone might say, apart from the form, apart from experience, apart from perception, apart from will, the other four candidates, leaving all those aside, I will make known the coming and going of consciousnesses. They're passing away in rebirth, their growth, increase and expansion. That is impossible. Consciousness is dependent, all consciousnesses is dependent upon the other four candors. Just as two sheaves of reeds might lead, stand leaning against each other, so too with the objects of consciousnesses, that's the Nama Rupa as condition, consciousnesses come to be. With consciousness as condition, the object of consciousnesses come to be. You need the others, you need the, the either the body or you have to have um, uh, experience, perception, will, all those things are necessary, this Nama and Rupa, for consciousness to exist. When one disappears, the other disappears, they're sheaves of reeds. If one were to remove one of those sheaves of reeds, the other would fall. So too, with the cessation of consciousnesses, the objects of consciousnesses cease to exist. 
with the cessation of the objects of consciousness, consciousnesses cease to exist. Cessation. Okay, that is five o'clock coming up soon. So, that's enough to disturb your meditation for 24 hours. <laughs> so enough to look at and think about. But it's not really there to be argued with. It's very powerful. There's, oh, quite, there's nothing here. So who's meditating? No one. So you don't have to attain anything. Oh, great. So I could just hang out, let go, and just just um, disappear for the rest of the, 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 the day. Oh, lovely. So what are you trying to achieve? Who's trying to achieve it? No, you just sit here and just let go. Nice way to meditate. So, that's enough for today. And any questions? Uh, I'll do a quick couple of minutes of questions, but most questions, I would invite you, the pieces of paper are outside with the pens. You can have a cue to ask your question before <coughs> you forget it. And we'll answer them this evening. But any people who are really hot to ask a question now? Yeah. Conscious engagement is like uh, when you are listening. Some people are listening to me, some people aren't, because they're not engaged. You see that when you know you sometimes give a talk, uh, especially if you go to schools and watch people give talks. Some people are looking at their their iPhone. <laughs> they're not really engaged. What's really terrible is when you go into airports like Changi, and have all these people that are watching their phone. And I've got to really, it's like, you know, dodge, dodge people, because they're not looking at anybody else, because they're not engaged with what's around them, they're engaged in the screen. So that's what engagement means. You know, there is some reason, you know, why you engage with that particular uh, mind object, and not others. And we see that afterwards, it's mostly brainwashing, conditioning. But that comes later on. But anyway, that there is the opportunity to have the Q&A this evening where we can discuss this in more depth. But for the time being. I do have one more question. The breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disengaging. No, go on. Uh, the whole breath. Savakaya. You, yeah, you refer to it as the breath body. Yeah. The whole breath body. Yeah. But um, uh, some will refer it to physical body. Not only physical, the whole breath body and the physical body. Yeah. The whole body. We have a look at what the Buddha says, Anapanasati Sutta. He said this is breath meditation. Not body meditation. You're watching the breath. And he says that the breath is counted as a body amongst all the bodies. In other words, it's just the, uh, just the way we talk, uh, you take a body of troops. So just look at you know, their legs or their whatever. No, it just means the, accommodate, the, the accumulation of a number of things. The body of evidence. You don't look at the lawyers with their bodies. You know, look at their brief. So this is oh, the other one which they say that kaya pati sangwedi, you experience it with your body. It doesn't mean, they have a simile of these two uh, monks were saying, yeah, they were stream enterers, but they hadn't gone any further. And what's a simile? They see the well, and they see the water in the bottom of the well, but they haven't managed to find the rope in the bucket to draw the water out. They can see it, but they haven't experienced it with their body. So you think, well, if you want to experience it with the body, jump in. That's not what it means. Kayapati Sangwedi is the, the idiom. Because you can't see, like, say, personal experience. I personally experience non-self. <laughs> <laughs> because, you now that, you know, is... Is this the idioms we mean? It means like 
direct experience. And that's you know, one thing which um, uh, translation attribute to Ajahn Pamali, direct experience, like, you know, not believing other people, but you know, that uh, your own five candidates experienced it. That's what we really mean there. But that will come up later on. This is just the start of your brainwashing. <laughs> but for those of you, do you have on your lunch like the buffet service? Yeah, you go and choose. Yes. Okay. Please, after a while, there will be two different lines. One <laughs> will be the self service, that's for the ordinary people. And for those who are enlightened, the no self service. <laughs> that way we can find who's understood all this, who hasn't. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think that's enough now. So we'll just pay it. Oh no, sadhus. Sadhu. Sadhu. Sadhu! Very good. Okay. So please don't think too much about this. Uh, I have uh, some people asking, well, should we contemplate, should we not contemplate? Please follow thoughts which end thoughts, not thoughts which create more thoughts. Okay. Okay, so see you this evening. Now it's tea time.